A year ago, I made What If Everything Went Perfect for the Central Powers. Today, we're following that up by exploring the opposing side. Now, this is actually far more difficult than you might imagine. Of course, it sounds simple, as we could just go the route of the Schlieffen Plan being a total disaster, Russia mobilizing faster and overrunning the German East, while other nations join and the war ends quickly. Now, sure, this is a good result for the Entente. But first, none of this is necessarily very realistic. Besides, is this even perfect for the Entente? Such a short war also means fewer demands can be placed on defeated nations. While nations like the Ottomans wouldn't have even entered the conflict, and so cannot be partitioned. For the Entente to benefit most, the war needs to drag. There is also a big issue with who are the Entente. For the Central Powers, this was far easier. The four nations that fought on their sides during the conflict. Germany, Austria-Hungary, Bulgaria and the Ottomans. For the Entente though, this metric leaves us with far more nations, whose national ambitions very much overlap. The core of the Entente are just France and Russia, joined later by Britain. This is already a much more workable definition as we just can't have everything go perfect for each of the minor powers. So, let's just keep it simple and ignore those powers. The only Entente members that we care about for the sakes of this video are Britain, France, Russia and Italy. Technically, we can also count Japan, but I can already say that not too much about them will change. I would have counted America, but as we'll soon see, they will not even get to join the war in this timeline. With that baseline established, we can dive right into the conflict. I want this timeline to start around 1914, not changing all too much before that point. If we're being honest, the Entente weren't the underdogs in this conflict, and the more we change before 1914, the more the war stops looking like our World War I. Much like in our timeline, we will have the assassination of Franz Ferdinand start the road to the final confrontation. The first thing I want to look at is the German invasion of France at the start of the war. What we saw in our timeline was not the Schlieffen plan as was originally thought up by von Schlieffen. Schlieffen had wanted to invade the Netherlands as well, allowing for a much broader front line to invade Belgium from, and allowing access to key Dutch railways to supply and move the army. This plan had been created back in 1905, when British neutrality was still counted on. But his replacement, von Moltke the Younger, would adapt this plan, deciding to spare the Dutch from invasion, preventing the nation from being used for British operations. Not invading would have the additional benefits of being able to use the Dutch as a hub to circumvent the British naval blockade on Germany. All in all, it was a pretty logical choice by the Germans, but far from an inevitable one. The benefits to the initial invasion could easily outweigh the other considerations, should it lead to a collapse of France. So, as our first change of the timeline, I propose that the Dutch do get invaded. Initially, this greatly favors the Germans. The Dutch army is in no position to go on the offensive. In fact, their military doctrine called for a retreat from 80% of the nation, setting up their defenses along their core territories. Of course, the Germans aren't actually interested in overrunning the Dutch fully, at least initially. So this extra front doesn't cost the Germans many extra soldiers. All the Germans do is blitz through the south relatively unopposed. Still, this by itself is not enough for the Germans to reach Paris. As the Russians start to mobilize and threaten the German eastern front, forces would still be redirected there and trench warfare sets into the west. The German gamble hasn't paid off. Now, as the front lines stabilize, the Germans end up holding less French territory than in our timeline, as forces need to be redirected to the Dutch front. By now though, the Dutch would have had months to reinforce their defenses, and it is possible that minor British forces have come to reinforce them as well. It is not impossible that Germany simply fails to occupy the Netherlands fully, but even if they do, it would absolutely be a struggle for them. By the end of the initial phase of the war, the front lines look something like this. 
with the Ottomans now also entering the conflict on the side of the Central Powers. If you're wondering why I'm not keeping them neutral, or even pro-Entente, it's simple. All four of the major Entente members really wanted to carve up the old empire, and this war would be the perfect excuse to do so. With that, we enter 1950, the most important year in the conflict due to diplomacy. Both sides were now doing just about all they could and promising anything to anyone to get as many nations as possible on their side. The Entente, historically, already very much have the upper hand here, but we can improve it just a little bit more. The nations to watch are Italy and Romania, both of which can be used to increase the pressure on the Austrians, as well as Greece and Bulgaria, both of which will make the Ottoman position near unholdable. Italy is easiest, they already joined early in our timeline, while Romania and Greece aren't immediate priorities. The real key to the Balkans is Bulgaria. Bulgaria had an impressive army for their size, and their choice will win the Balkans for either side. They could threaten the Ottoman capital or secure its flag, while helping overrun Serbia. But quite simply put, the Central Powers offered them the far better deal immediate territorial gains from the Ottomans, all claims on Serbia respected, and further gains on Romania and Greece should they join the Entente. Meanwhile, the Entente was divided. They couldn't agree on what to do, and diplomatically, the three main members far from agreed with each other. This led to it being quite unclear what exactly the Entente was offering Bulgaria. Eventually, something like this was offered. These parts of Ottoman Thrace, roughly these territories from Serbia, and vague notions of gains from Greece. The big issue? Serbia and Greece both completely opposed ceding any territories to Bulgaria, and the Entente didn't put in the effort to get them to accept. Thus, while Bulgaria was deliberating which of the two deals they would accept, the Germans massively pushed out the Russians, convincing Bulgaria to side with the Central Powers. Now this German push is not something that we can prevent without significant buffs to Russia, which I am not willing to do. So we need Bulgaria to join sooner. For this, we need the Entente to be more unified and decisive, as major parts of Thrace are promised, with hints that Bulgaria may even gain more. Pressure is being put on Greece to cede territories, and in exchange, Greece is going to be compensated in Anatolia. Finally, Serbia is forced to cede major parts of Macedonia immediately after the Entente make it very clear what might happen to Serbia if they don't. Besides these, generous loans to Serbia and Bulgaria are promised to ease tensions. Bulgaria is convinced and joins the Entente side of the conflict. This is quite literally a disaster for the Central Powers. Any hope for the Ottomans have dried up, especially with Serbia still fighting at this point. Soon, the Bulgars start marching down to Constantinople. They don't have to take it, but Ottoman focus on their capital sees their other fronts collapse even earlier, while it is clear that the capital won't be able to hold out for years. Germany still commits to their offensive against Russia and attempts to knock out Serbia, but the Bulgarians manage to ensure a defense against the Central Powers, potentially seizing more Serbian territories in their moment of weakness turning Bulgaria into a bit of a pariah state, but one that for now, the Entente desperately needs to appease. With this pressure on the Ottomans, calls to join the war within Greece would also be intensifying. I'm sorry for the quick intermission, but by far most of you aren't subscribed. Keep up to date with all the latest releases, including a sequel to this one on Tuesday, consider doing so. Thank you. Now, we have reached another major point for the Entente. In our timeline, Britain had attempted to launch a naval invasion of the Ottomans. But, with the Bulgarians in the war, this would swiftly be over. This leaves Britain open for other ventures. In our timeline, a lot of British effort went into mobilizing a conscript army to support the French war effort. This was very costly, weakening the British Empire massively in the long term. So instead, I propose that Britain pursues a plan thought up by the Admiral of the fleet, John Fisher. The plan called for a minor British force to operate in France. 
while Commonwealth forces would continue to fight in the Balkans and against the Ottomans. Britain itself, though, would focus on a different goal, the blockading of Germany, all of it. Now, compared to our timeline, the blockade is already a lot stronger, because the Germans cannot circumvent it via the Netherlands. Still, Germany is not fully isolated. The Baltics are still open, and so resources from Scandinavia continue to flow into Germany. Especially Swedish resources are sometimes credited with keeping the German war industry running for years longer than they otherwise might have, at least at that intensity. Cutting off this supply has the potential to seriously collapse German industry. Now immediately, I have to be honest. While the plan I am going to describe would be very effective in weakening Germany, its feasibility is debated. It is not impossible that it would succeed, but it does require a lot of luck on Britain's part, not to mention some internal changes in order to even be considered. The plan is very risky, and if that backfired, Britain would be in a rough spot. With that disclaimer, the basic plan is simple. We start by blockading the North Sea. That is the easy part. Then we start building a bunch of new, cheap ships, custom made to be able to pass through the narrow passes near Denmark. We then force Denmark to allow this fleet past, after which we try to sabotage both sides of the Kiel Canal, a waterway allowing Germany to circumvent Denmark. Now the German fleet would be trapped on one of their two coasts, likely the North Sea one. Here it has two choices. Just sit there and allow Britain to take control over the Baltic Sea. Or attempt to come out for a climactic confrontation. A confrontation that Britain would love, allowing them to destroy the German fleet and solidify their blockade yet further. If all goes to plan, German imports from all over the world would be halted, while a new route to supply Russia with would be opened. To make this happen, we go back to 1940. Before the war, Denmark, as part of their neutrality, had promised not to mine the waters in the narrow sea around them, because such a move would mean Britain couldn't send ships into the Baltic, while Germany could still use the Kiel Canal to move between the seas. Yet, when the war started, Germany demanded that Denmark do it anyways, and Britain did nothing, ensuring that the Baltics were indeed closed. Instead, in this alternate timeline, Britain needs to come down hard on Denmark, even threatening a naval invasion or attacks on Danish cities. The British message is clear. Fully respect your neutrality or else. While Germany would complain, the Baltic Sea, for now, remains open to British shipping. For about a year, nothing would actually happen, until Britain executes their Baltic plan. The North Sea is first blockaded and Britain starts harassing the Kiel Canal from the west. From there, the first custom ships, smaller, cheaper and obsolete ones, start a blockade there. Now, Germany has two choices. Let all of this happen and basically give up on winning the naval war, or try and invade Denmark, to cut off the British route. If the second is chosen, Germany likely manages to occupy the Danish mainland, while Britain would have already had forces prepared to defend the Danish islands. Germany attempts to restrict British actions, first with minor actions, coastal confrontations, and counter-submarine warfare against the British, but eventually they would need to do something drastic, as with the Dutch not neutral and routes to Scandinavia closed, German industry would start to struggle significantly. A major naval battle ensues, which Britain likely wins. But even if they don't, at best it would be a Pyrrhic victory for Germany as Britain is forced to pull their blockade back a bit and then returns with newly built ships. After all of this, Germany has no neutral nations to trade with, as their economy would start collapsing a lot faster, while the Russians are in a much healthier position due to British and French aid via the Baltics. Now, we do need to discuss another major drawback of this plan. The French would basically be fighting on their own on the continent. The British don't send millions of their own to reinforce the French lines. For this scenario, that is not an issue, since I will have the war end earlier than in our timeline. But imagine the British tried this in our timeline, with French defenses only half as strong as in our timeline. 
Germany eventually breaking through in such a scenario is not out of the realm of possibility. Again, Lord Fisher's plan had a lot of potential, but was always very risky. And on its own, it is not necessarily a free victory card for Britain. Anyways, let's circle back to the Ottomans. In late 1915, early 1916, Istanbul would fall. The great capital of the Ottoman Empire is in Entente hands. And this would start the fast unraveling of the empire. As from all sides, the Entente are moving in, and central authority starts to break down. Halfway through 1916, I'd expect the Ottoman Empire to have collapsed, with the Entente securing most of the nation. These victories have opened up yet another route to supply the Russians from. These supply routes aren't necessarily enough to fix all of the issues that Russia is facing, but their military is better supplied, their trains run better, their food situation is improved. Meanwhile, the military victories in the Ottomans have emboldened the eastern giant. Should the war last for years more, Russia will still collapse, but they can last for months longer than they could in our timeline. This leads us to the rest of 1916. The collapse of the Ottomans leads to the Entente reinforcing other fronts. This is also the moment where the Entente sends an ultimatum to Romania, forcing them to join the war as well, something they did in our timeline. Now, Russia and Romania start a massive operation against Austria-Hungary, and the pressure is immense. In our timeline, Romania joining was pretty bad for the Entente, as Bulgaria and Austria easily overran it. But with Bulgaria and the Balkans, Securely in the hands of the Entente, Romania is a great addition, allowing one large front line to encompass all of Eastern Europe. By now, everyone would see that the Central Powers cannot win this war. The Western Front is stuck, the Russians aren't surrendering, and the Balkan Front has started moving towards Vienna. The situation would be most clear to Kaiser Karl, who takes the reins of the Empire in late 1960. Much like in our timeline, he attempts to negotiate a back-end deal to end the war. But in our timeline, the Germans refused. They knew that Russia was close to collapse, and they hoped that they could still clutch out a victory. There would be no such hope here. The Habsburg Kaiser makes the correct decision. To have any chance at preserving the monarchy, they must surrender now. So rather than Austria-Hungary attempting to end the war in its entirety, it is simply a desperate attempt to minimize the inevitable Habsburg loss. When Germany learns of this, at worst, they may attempt to militarily force the Austrians to continue the war. But it would soon be clear that this is pointless. The Central Power front lines were collapsing, Germany did not have enough forces to stop their bleeding, and the German government would send a telegram to Britain. They were now willing to negotiate. The Great War was over, and a peace deal would be completely different. Now by far most importantly, the idealist President Wilson of America is now replaced with the imperialist Tsar Nicholas of Russia. Russia, having suffered greatly throughout the war, is out for blood at the peace conference. Rather than the Entente powers having a nice spread in negotiating attitudes from lenient to harsh, the Entente leans far heavier to the harsh sides. So, Let's see how they partition Europe. Let's start with the weakest central powers, the Ottomans. In this timeline, I highly doubt that the Turkish independence movement would be successful. The Ottomans were defeated much earlier and more decisively, while the shorter war means that the Entente are more willing to commit to their occupation zone. Most importantly though, the Russian Empire is involved and very much committed to the Ottomans' destruction. For Russia, their single most important war goal, their core motivation for all of this, was gaining Istanbul from the Ottomans. There is no way that the Russians would ever allow for a rebounding of Turkey after this conflict. So, let's start partitioning, where the first thing is, Russia gets Constantinople. This would be heavily opposed by Britain, but like I mentioned, it is Russia's number one priority. One which Russia would gladly trade in exchange for taking less from Germany than they might have otherwise wanted. Britain would still be very uncomfortable and push for any other solution. International control, Greek annexation, Bulgarian annexation, preferential Russian shipping. But Russia does not budge. 
demanding significant territories around it too. I could imagine a deal eventually being reached that looks something like this. Bulgaria gains much of eastern Thrace, while Britain gets influence over the other side of the water. This way, Russian Constantinople is small and difficult to defend, and Britain still has a lot of means to weaken Russian shipping with. Moving down, Greece would get western Anatolia, in exchange for the territory they had to give to Bulgaria earlier on. In the south, Italy gains part of the coastline, as well as a sphere over western Anatolia. France would establish itself in Syria and further influence in southern Anatolia. Britain would seize much of the Middle East and establish a sphere over Kurdistan. Russia further expands by gaining Armenia. Importantly, there are some key changes about the Middle East. The League of Nations does not exist, and these territories are taken as full colonies rather than mandates. The remaining Ottoman Empire is also not in a great position. The Entente powers wanted to rewrite the Ottoman government, essentially turning the remaining Sultanate into little more than a joint Entente puppet. Let's now move on to Europe. Like we discussed earlier, Bulgaria had seized a lot of Serbian territory during the war, leading to them very much becoming the black sheep of the Balkans. This also means that the other nations are more aggressive in their demands. It is very possible that Serbia unites with Montenegro and gains northern Albania, with Greece gaining the south. The remnants would likely become a protectorate of Italy. This strengthening of Italy is a very deliberate move by the British. With the war over, Britain would start to worry again about the rise of Russia, and strengthening Italy could be a major British policy point in order to combat the rise of Russia and their perceived Slavic allies. This would lead to the original Treaty of London being respected, and after accounting for the significant expansion that Serbia would experience, Italy might even gain even more to counter Russia's primary ally in the region. The rest of the Habsburg Empire is spared from total partition, but they do suffer significantly. Poland had been given autonomy by Germany, and when Russia restored order, they would try to respect this autonomy, at least on paper. Then, they would use the excuse of uniting Poland to seize Austrian Galicia. Romania is compensated with parts of Transylvania, but not quite as much as they got in our own timeline, with Romania joining late and Austria-Hungary surrendering on their own. It is even possible, if Italy is assertive and Britain sufficiently afraid of the rise of Russia, Italy might even gain all of Dalmatia. Now on paper, it might seem like the Habsburg Empire is now safe, right? Well, not quite. Their underlying issues are unsolved. Their economic depression post-war will hit extremely hard. The Hungarians will likely try to fully break away, with revolts in Czechia and even Austria itself likely seeing the full destruction of the Habsburg monarchy. During this collapse, several nations would start wars and border conflicts, which continued to divide the region yet further. Of course, it's impossible to tell, but something like this is what I would predict the region ends up looking like. This leads us to the final central power, Germany. The Pacific isn't that interesting, with the only difference being German Samoa going to Japan, or more likely Britain, instead of America. The African peace is also likely unchanged, with Britain and France dividing up the German Empire, and Italy being compensated with the expansion of Libya and East Africa. With that done, let's dive into the actual interesting stuff. France would seize the Alsace back, and hungry for coal, they 100% also annexed the Saarland, crucial for French energy independence after the war. Then, Belgium and the Netherlands likely also expand their eastern border. France would try to split the Rhineland away from Germany. This, simultaneously, takes away Germany's border to invade West from, as well as their major industrial heartland, a massive weakening of the German nation. Britain would try their best to oppose this move, but Russia would support it. Considering that France fought the Western Front basically on their own, there would be little that could stop them from making this happen, as France asserts their sovereignty. I don't expect France to take this territory directly, but rather they might split it between two puppet regimes. Though already, Germany is getting a worse deal than in our timeline, but we're not done. In the north, 
Denmark wanted these territories, which they would definitely get. But they would get forced by the great powers to accept even more land, likely up to here. Denmark wasn't that enthusiastic about gaining that many Germans in their border, but for France and Britain this was important, as it would represent Germany losing control over the Kiel Canal. In our timeline, America forced Britain and France to stop demanding the Denmark annexed territory that they didn't want. But without America in the war, and with Denmark having been invaded by the Germans, they probably end up with the territories. To the east, Germany's losses would be limited. Likely, in exchange for being allowed to take Constantinople, Russia agrees to moderate gains here. Something like this is what I would expect. With Poland still being a part of the Russian Empire, there is no reason to push them up to the coast. For Britain, saving as much of Germany as possible would be a major policy point. They know very well that they are currently preparing to take down the new threat to European balance, building a coalition to take down the Russians in the future. Then, to conclude this video with, we zoom into Britain. Due to them not doing mass conscription, the Irish wouldn't launch their uprising to secure independence after the war. Rather, I'd expect home rule to be implemented, turning Ireland into an autonomous part of the British Empire, much like the other dominions. Speaking of dominions, with the lack of a disaster like Gallipoli, they might be slightly closer to Britain after the war. But for the most part, their path to independence was already long underway, and preventing Gallipoli isn't enough for something radical like an imperial federation. So, that's the outcome of the war. But the timeline isn't done. Next Tuesday, we will discuss the consequences of this peace deal, and the potential Anglo-Russian Cold War that is upcoming, as well as the role of the other powers in this potential confrontation. Subscribe not to miss it. For now, I will simply thank you all for watching. Consider leaving a like and a comment, as well as subscribing, and if you've enjoyed this video, Click the video on top to watch another in this series. If you've already seen it, then I'm sure that the bottom video is great too. Once again, thank you all for watching, and goodbye.